I'm going to blow your mind right now. Do you know who's the number one seller of cars in the country? Who is the number one seller of cars in the country? It's Costco. Costco is the number one seller of new cars in the country. There are certain brands that just don't lease well, like the Toyotas and whatnot. They just don't lease well. The rates are just not attractive. And look, what's a good lease, right? A good lease is ultimately how much are you paying per month relative to the price of the car? You know, I remember 10 years ago, I was standing in the lane at the biggest auction in the world, Mannheim, Pennsylvania. I bought like 30 Chevy Cruises. Like what? Chevy Cruze, it's like, it was like a $7,000 car at the time. I stole those cars. I bought them like $4,000 under value. I think we sold all of those in the next 30 days. I do believe that most EVs are less expensive to maintain over the lifetime of that vehicle, with the big exception again, being the battery, which is why I say just lease the car. You don't have to deal with it. It's not your grandfather's car market anymore. So says a man known as Car Dealership Guy, a.k.a. Yossi Levy, who knows more about cars and the automotive market than anyone I know. He took the time to share insider guidance for anyone thinking about purchasing, leasing, or selling a car. Which car do you go after? Which car do you stay away from? Are electric vehicles, a.k.a. EVs, the way to go? And what does Yossi know about the auto industry that can help you practically? I love how he broke things down for the everyday person, people like me and you. But before we dive in, I want to acknowledge the conversations on prior episodes that have taken a critical stance on car leasing and buying expensive cars, and for good reason. Yossi, on the other hand, approaches the car market from a different perspective. His insights come from the dealership side. So some of his views might differ from our previous discussions. Our goal here is to provide you valuable knowledge and resources from various angles. Yossi, as you'll learn, is a nuts and bolts guy, and he uses data and common sense, unlike a typical rah-rah car enthusiast. We believe this conversation will provide you with practical insights to navigate the ever-changing car market effectively. Enjoy. Being a Jew, awesome. Managing personal finances, not so awesome. Welcome to Kosher Money. An entire episode on cars. Yossi Levy, we got you. It took time. We had to, you know, do a bunch of Google searches. First of all, at the beginning, we didn't even know who you were, right? You were running anonymously online. Introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and we'll go from there. Yossi Levy, founder of Car Dealership Guy. You may have seen me on X if uh, if you're a follower. Uh, I was a dealer for 13 years. I founded a venture-backed online auto retailing startup in 2018. Raised for that company over $50 million of venture capital, grew it to close to $100 million in annual sales. And then end of 2021 came around, interest rates started rising, and the business did not do well. And ultimately, we failed. And I kind of had to find myself. I said, okay, what's next for me? Um, I had all this experience in cars, and I was always very creative. And you know, I built this rather large auto retailer, um, and you know, market forces just you know, didn't favor us, and we didn't make it. And I had this anonymous Twitter account, Car Dealership Guy. Uh, and I was having a ton of fun with it. And I said, let me just share my knowledge with the world, right? I've built, I've, you know, I've, I've done lots of retailing. I've seen a lot of things or on, you know, on a relative basis. Um, and I think this could be valuable to the world. And so as I shared insights, you know, got a lot of notoriety. I got some really big, uh, you know, shares and, you know, lots of press picked it up. It ended up actually launching a media company uh, on the back of that. Um, and so today, Car Dealership Guy is the fastest growing automotive retail media company. Uh, in the industry. Uh, we do over 120 million impressions a month on social. Um, and we really, our goal is to just like, demystify the car industry. Uh, we think that more transparency can be good for dealers and consumers. Um, it shouldn't have to be a bad thing, rather just everyone knowing more, especially at a time like now with you know the car market has been so volatile over the last couple of years. And so having a blast today, you know, we're a small tight team um, and really just trying to put out the best content for dealers and consumers on the internet. So we were always nervous to do a car leasing episode. When we're creating content, we want it to be evergreen. We want it to be long lasting. We don't, we're in July, 2024 right now, but we were nervous back in 2022 to do an episode. And had we done one, most of that information would have been irrelevant as it relates to practicality, right? The information that was applicable a couple of years ago is somewhat moot right now. So Thinking about the conversation we're going to have and hopefully the practical takeaways slash advice we're going to give people, how certain or confident are you that the things we'll share with people will have longstanding relevance that they can keep in mind if someone's surfing YouTube and watching this in May of 2026? 
Look, there are certain things that are cyclical or that change pretty often and rapidly. And there's other things that are evergreen, right? Like actionable ways to maybe get the best deal, make the smartest financial decision for you and your family when you're buying a car, selling a car, trading a car. All those things can be very evergreen. But over time, right? And over as months go by, they do oscillate. So some months, it might be a better, you know, months to lease. Or like, for example, to give you a quick example, the last three years, right? It wasn't a really a great time to lease, right? Because automakers weren't incentivized to put forward great offers for leasing because they knew that they could just get that car sold, right? Make that money quicker. So why even try to incentivize a lease? But today, leasing is much more attractive for most brands than it was over the past couple of years, right? That has changed. But what hasn't changed are how is a lease structured, right? What are the components that make up a lease? And is this actually what I want for myself. So it really depends. Certain things are evergreen, but of course, the car business has been extremely fluid over the last couple of years and things are changing very rapidly. Friend calls you up, says, Yossi, give me some advice. I'm looking to get a new car (laughs) or a used car. I don't know if I should buy. I don't know if I should lease. Prices are coming down. They're going up. I'm lost right now. But But I will tell you this. I want to get the most value, right? I want to drive a vehicle that is not going to be too harsh on my pocket. Where do you guide them? And I know there are a million different answers to this question because it kind of depends who you are, yeah. but let's try to break it down. It's extremely subjective. You're absolutely right. You know, everyone is like, "Oh, I want the best value." And then you discover that they want, you know, some fancy features or maybe they, you know, they have to have a a large pickup truck, right? So, it's extremely subjective. Here's like the the basic rules of thumb, right? First of all, again, used and new are constantly flip-flopping, right? Use Certain used vehicles today are great deals and while others are not. And as we know, last couple of years has been mayhem and you know markups and all that. First thing I would tell this friend is follow the new car trends, right? What new cars are dropping in value fastest right now or you know have the biggest price cuts, right? Because new cars with the biggest price cuts are going to trickle down and translate to the comparable used versions of those cars also getting large price cuts. And so first thing is just like very simplistically, right? Like where are the incentives? Where are the deals? I actually post this on my social media every one to two weeks. I post a list of like the best deals out in the market, zero down, leases, blah, blah, blah. And people love it. It's very actionable, right? But the first thing is like, right, where are we seeing incentives? Now, there's, it, let's take it one step further, right? Manufacturers put incentives on slow moving vehicles or vehicles that are not moving at you know the proper rates that they're targeting right so where you see the most supply is also where you're going to you should anticipate the most incentives to come so today if you look and I post this as well right I post inventory levels and and whatnot for manufacturers so today as an example you're seeing the most supply still with Stellantis so Stellantis is you know Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram Fiat right it's those brands that's the it's the corporate name they have you know, historically high levels of supply and dealers are struggling to move those vehicles, right? Now, as a consumer, if I'm in the market and maybe I'm looking to get a great deal, quote unquote, or get the largest amount of money chopped off a price stack of a car, I might look towards them as an example because I know that they're oversupplied right, in the market. They have too many vehicles and they're going to continue sweetening those incentives to make it attractive for me to buy that car. So this does vary, right? They, the one big caveat to this is that why have they gotten to this point where, Estella, I'm using Stellantis again as an example, why have they gotten to this point? Well, because they raised prices almost 50% from 2019 till I want to say about 2023, right? Or, or end of 22. I mean, it was like a three and a half, four year period where they raised prices like 49%. And so you know, it's kind of chicken or the egg. That's how you get into the situation to begin with where your deals are not compelling enough, but you should also expect those brands to quickly rebound and get aggressive in order to put, you know, metal on the road, as they say. Yeah. Cause I was going to ask, is the oversupply a red flag, right? Is there something wrong with these vehicles? Are they not appealing to people for a certain reason? And that's why you're seeing that discount, but you're saying that it generally is a result of overpricing And now they have to come down. Is that right? Yeah. Look, you're going to have negotiation leverage. um, And like I said, incentives will typically be sweeter and hotter. So you might actually end up getting a better deal on a net basis. Um, But it does not mean that if you find a vehicle that's middle of the road on supply, again, I post these sheets and lists pretty often, where you'll see still some 
pretty compelling deals, right? Now, middle of the road, that could mean like, you know, Hyundai and Nissan. Um, I, I want to say like Mercedes is sort of middle of the road right now in supply, right? When you start getting to Toyota, Honda, Lexus, uh, Subaru, that's when supply gets really tight. Uh, you know, they're typically operating with like 30 to 40 day supply worth of vehicles, which just means that if they did not produce one more vehicle, they would sell out at the current pace of all those vehicles within 30 to 40 days. So those brands, again, still very tough to find the most desirable vehicles, right? You can find a normal Toyota or like an internal combustion engine Toyota, right? Like a regular Camry and stuff like that. You can find those. But when you want the hybrids, those are much tougher to find with Toyota and they're operating an incredibly low day supply. And you're just unlikely to get, you know, a, a discount necessarily on those vehicles in this market. People in, in my community, they were a lot of minivans. And when they were approaching the end of their lease, they were extending it maybe six months, a year. But that's sort of been phased away because they've already extended their lease and the car companies are like, no, we're not doing this anymore. So at that point, they're questioning, hey, maybe I should buy the car out versus taking a new lease. When you're posed with a question like that, what comes to mind? What should people keep in mind when it comes to buying out a lease versus taking out a new lease or financing a used vehicle, a lot of moving parts for people that really don't have any experience in that space. Yeah, it totally depends on the vehicle. I mean, you should treat the vehicle as an asset, meaning check out what it's worth in the market, right? If you can sell that to, you know, online to a dealer, Carvana, CarMax, someone for $30,000, and you know that your lease buyout is 25000 then yeah, you should buy it, right? Otherwise, you're leaving money on the table. But it really depends, right? Because what we've saw, if you go back a couple of years, what we saw was this crazy run up in prices to where vehicles were worth a lot more than their buyout, right? Because as ma when manufacturers lease these vehicles to consumers, no one predicted that vehicle prices would inflate 35 to 40%, depending on used, new, and whatnot. No one predicted that. So people leased vehicles at much lower prices, I mean, on a relative basis. Today, Right, lots of those vehicles and values have retracted. That has really been led by the electric vehicle market, where prices have fallen as much as fifty percent. Um, it's pretty pretty crazy to think about, but you know that's how far prices have fallen, which has left lots of dealers and consumers holding the bag, and also put them in a position where buying out their leases in many cases is not the right financial decision anymore. Because in some cases, your vehicle is worth um, in less than how much it's going to cost you to buy it out. So I would say it's on a per vehicle basis. You should check out how much is that vehicle worth and then decide, hey, do I have the money to buy out this lease and it makes sense at this price? Or maybe I don't have all that capital to put up front. I can just you know try to extend the lease for another year or some period of time. Can you trust those apps on the pricing that they give you? I know they ask quite a few questions to get an understanding of the quality of the vehicle, miles, et cetera. But is it just as easy as downloading a Carvana and getting a, a price quote from there? Yeah. When you say those apps, I mean, I think it, there's a wide spectrum of players in the space. I would tell you that on an aggregate, it's gotten much more transparent, right? As CarMax, Carvana, like the big behemoths have sort of pumped all this advertising, hey, we will buy your car, right? The industry, you know, these tech companies armed the dealers with the proper technology so that they can do the same. So today I would say, for the most part, it's at parity across all industry players, meaning like everyone nowadays buys cars. Most dealers will buy that car sight unseen or at least give you, you know, a very tight offer sight unseen. It's gotten pretty easy and risk-free. There's still some nuances. Certain dealers do it a lot better than others for sure. But yes, it's real. I mean, you know, you just sell your car nowadays. I'm sure lots of people listening to this have done this. It's pretty easy, right? Online, you get an offer. And frankly, like that's what that's one of those you know, like evolutions in the industry that we've needed for a long time, right? Like just getting, selling your car should not have been a hard thing. It took some time, but I feel like the industry from that perspective, it, ha it still has some more work to do on the buying side, but I feel like on the selling side, we've come a long way. Back in the day, that was your day-to-day? -day. People come, pull up to the dealership, knock on your uh, window, say, hey, I want to buy this. You take a look around, you're like, hmm, give you 15K for that. Was that, was that what that old life was like? Look, old life was... And by the way, this still does happen some places, let me be very clear, right? But old life was someone comes in, you know, you see how much that vehicle is going for at the auction, right? And you just try to get the vehicle for as least as possible, right? 
That's just the reality, right? There was no, there wasn't this democratization of like valuations. Not, you know, you couldn't just go online and get all these values and it just wasn't like this, right? And everyone was just, you know, it's kind of, hey, can I get the best deal? Can I get the best deal? Now, in the early 2000s, CarMax really came with this like, you know, one price models and whatnot and kind of transparency started being a thing in the car business, just like, you know, in real estate and whatnot. And it really picked up steam, right, over the last two decades. And so today, Right. It's no, it's no longer like, hey, you come in a lot. Like, let me just kind of look at it. Right. First of all, you're coming on a lot. You already have a great sense of what your car's worth. Right. You already plugged in that number in like five different websites. You know what your car's worth. Right. You're really shopping who's going to give you the best price. And then it just comes with like aligning expectations. Like, did you really disclose the vehicle properly? And beyond that, let me stroke your check. Look, at the end of the day, any car I buy off the street at its market value will be a better deal than me trying to buy that car at the auction, if I can even find it at the auction. Buying from the street, a dealer typically will make on average like $600 more than a vehicle purchased at auction. Plus, they get vehicles that are not even available at auctions because not every type of car you'll even get at an auction to begin with. There isn't a used car factory, right? So you really just, you know, as, as a dealer, right, you, you really want those cars off the street. And I will tell you, when I was growing up in the business, it wasn't a big thing to buy cars off the street. There was less competition. The auctions, you could still get much better deals. Information wasn't as democratized as it is today. Like I would, you know, I remember maybe like 10 years ago, I was standing in a lane at the biggest auction in the world, Mannheim, Pennsylvania. I bought like 30 Chevy Cruises. Like what? Chevy Cruises. It was like a $7,000 car at the time. I think we sold all those in the next 30 days. That wouldn't happen today, right? Because I stole those cars at the time. I bought them like $4,000 under value. Right? Like that would not happen today when every dealer has proxy bids set up on cars and technology and you know the, the market has changed significantly, but I think net net it's it's been it's been for the better. A quick break from this week's episode to tell you what Twillery is cooking up. So in August, if you're listening to this in 2024, they're having a warehouse sale. We're gonna tell you all about that. Put a link into the show notes. Um, I wear these old school cargo shorts, which people make fun of me. So I'm going to get a pair or two of the ear shorts, which I'm kind of excited about. A lot of my shorts actually go over my knee. So uh, someone's like, why don't you have Twillery ear shorts? And I said, good call. I'm going to get those. If you want an ear suit, we've been promoting those as well. Much lighter suit, especially August, hottest month of the year. And then in September, they're going to have these blazers in new colors, these performance blazers, stretch material, a lot of good things happening on the Twillery side. They're not resting on their laurels. I think laurels is a garment. I'm not sure. Maybe they're pants, but good pun, I think. Twillery.com slash kosher money. Use our promo code Chai. You get $18 off, $139 purchase if it's your first purchase. We're going to try to work on some other promo codes as we enter the new year. But big school year, got to look good, got to look sharp. I'm wearing their pants almost every day, but some days I actually want to wear shorts. Um, so I'm going to look into that. Stay tuned. Enjoy. Thank you to our friends at Twillery. Link in the show notes. And now back to this week's episode. People's antennas gone up when you said best time of the year to buy, best time of the month to lease. Walk me through that, right? People have a pen in their hand. They're like, Yossi, give it to me. Tell me what months to stay away from car buying slash leasing. When should I get in? Yeah, look, the first thing that comes to mind is, as a used car guy myself is, you know, you're looking for a used car, right? The hottest time of the year is going to be what's called the tax refund season when everyone's getting their tax refunds. So, you know, typically March, April is just going to be a more challenging time for a buyer because you're just going to have way more competition and way less supply. It's just supply and demand. When you want to look at new cars, first of all, the first thing I would preface this is that it's much less like it used to be where you know, end, end of end of month, end of quarter, end of year. Like that used to be like the holy grail. It's And that still holds true today, but not like in the past. Like today you can truly find, you know, a manufacturer just needs to get rid of some more supply. They'll throw some crazy deal. I posted about Toyota. Toyota has this like little kind of Mickey Mouse electric vehicle. It's like this thing is, you know, not really a hot, a hot seller at all. And they put some like $99 a month deal on it. This was like a couple months back. I posted about this. It got like 3 million impressions. and the thing was gone within like a week. All the dealers that were posting below were like, we have none left. So the point I'm trying to make is like dealers will do like these crazy deals or manufacturers will push these crazy incentives and deals to clear up their supply, right? They got to get these things off balance sheet. They want to get rid of them. So those are like ad hoc deals, right? Another thing to look out for is just like when models are changing, right? So when a vehicle has a, maybe a new model coming out, 
maybe a different body style, it's going to take a hit, the prior models. And that's probably a good time, again, if, if you're okay with that older body style, right? That's probably a better time to buy that vehicle. And of course, it goes without saying, right? End of week, end of month, end of year, right? Dealers are very incentivized on volume targets. So are the salespeople, right? Um, Stair-step programs, right? You sell X amount of vehicles, will the manufacturer will pay you X amount. You sell 100 vehicles, will pay you this amount. Again, it depends on the manufacturer. And lots of manufacturers have done away with stair-step programs, but not all. It's still out there. Dealers are still incentivized by volume and they want to put metal on the road. And so, yeah, you come at you know end of month, end of quarter, there may be a better option for you because it's not just a manufacturer, it's also the actual employees, right? I might be a manager and I know if I sell X amount of cars, my manager gives me an incentive. So, you know, you get closer to that end of, you know, some period of time, um, you know, you're likely to be able to possibly have a little bit more negotiation leverage, but really get what you want at the price you want. I saw one of my brothers driving a Volvo and I said, oh, you got a Volvo? That's like uncharacteristic. He says, no, every six months they have a deal. So they're practically paying me for this car. And then I see another friend and he's driving, let's call it a Mickey Mouse electric car. And I said, what's the deal? You you used to have a, a, a large truck. And he goes, yeah, I got it through Costco. And I'm like, Yep. You know, yep. we're gone with the dealership days and now you can accidentally walk into a bakery and come out with a car. And I'm like, you know, I, I didn't know Costco offers. He goes, no, you have to do it this way. And there are deals out there, but you're saying you got to sniff them out. I'm going to blow your mind right now. Do you know who's the number one of seller of cars in the country? Who is the number one seller of cars in the country? It's Costco. Costco is the number one seller of new cars in the country. Someone can fact check me if it maybe changed in the last 12 months. I don't think it has. Okay. Costco is a number one seller of new cars in the country. It's actually unbelievable. Uh, when I heard this, I was just blown away. Now, for what it's worth, they're not actually selling the car. Um, like you still go to the dealership. But the fact is, Costco is massive. It's very popular. They do tons of leases. Yes, Volvo leases through Costco. Volvo in general has some pretty compelling leases. I also have some friends that I saw pulling up in a Volvo XC90. And I'm like, what's up with the Volvo? Not that Volvo's, like Volvo's a great car, by the way, uh, but I was just surprised. He's like, oh yeah, it was, it was a leasing deal. So Costco is phenomenal. They sell tons of cars and you could get you could get some deals there. I wouldn't just rely on it. I would still kind of you know weigh out all your options. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Costco in, and especially Volvo, like great deals. You know, you can get deals on like Nissans. There are certain brands that just don't lease well, like I said earlier, like the Toyotas and whatnot. They just don't lease well. The rates are just not attractive. And look, what's a good lease, right? A good lease is ultimately like how much are you paying per month relative to the price of the car, right? Like that's how you really measure a good lease. Like BMW leases very well many times. When you think about it, right? Like that's really the equation. Every vehicle varies. A lease is really comprised of three things, right? Like the net cap cost, which is the price of the car. You add the residual value of the car, which is what the car will be worth when you return in a couple of years. And then all that is multiplied by something called the money factor, which is essentially a fancy term that the industry invented for like interest rate. It's like a decimal point of interest rate, but it, it's pretty much the interest rate. When you take all that into consideration, right? Like that's how a lease is comprised. And, you know, different manufacturers will put different figures depending on time of year, how many cars they need to sell, is it in high supply, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that's pretty much how it works. So with the car industry being as mature as it is, to, coupled with the fact that all the data, if not most of it, is online, how much does old school negotiation play a role? Can someone say, hey, I went to that dealership, I spoke to that provider, and I got X price, and then his friend comes in and says, ah, you didn't haggle with them. You could have gotten it for $500 cheaper. Are those days gone or there's still a role in negotiation? Depends on the vehicle um, and depends on the dealership. What I'll tell you is that dealers want to sell cars. They want to put cars on the road. And so on one hand, like everything's negotiable. There's always room. You can always sweeten it up a little bit. The competition between dealers has never been greater given the internet and transparency and marketplaces. And so one thing you have to note is that Dealers, for the most part, are putting their best price already online, right? Because they need to compete with every other dealer out there. And so, you know, I always used to laugh. People used to come to us. They used to come in a lot and be like, hey, I'll, I offer you $4,000 less than the advertised price. And just like, listen, appreciate you like coming here, but like we're, you're wasting my time like, and I'm wasting yours, right? Like it doesn't make any sense. So it depends on the vehicle. Like if a dealer is overpricing their car to begin with by $4,000, they're not going to sell it. It doesn't make any sense. Like it, no one's going to come in. 
there's always some wiggle room. There just is. What you want to do, I'm going to give a shout out here to another an, another automotive creator called The Car Mom, which I love this uh, tip that she always puts out. But the best way to really do this is to actually find, go on a, a website called Dealer Raider in advance, dealerrader.com, and look up the best salesperson at that dealership. Because when you do that, right? You find the best person in advance. Don't just walk into the dealership. Like that's a terrible idea, right? Find the best salesperson, work with them first remotely. They'll work with you to get a deal. There's a reason they're the best salesperson. So I like her tip that she puts out on this specific topic, because this is how you actually save time and get a good deal, right? You go to the best person clearly by all their ratings, and then you know, you're able to save a lot of time and they're going to get you a real deal. Let's pivot. And I don't even want to ask a question here. I just want to throw a topic into the ethernet and you just grab it and take it whatever direction you want. Electric cars slash Tesla. He did not, in fact, merely throw out a topic. Moments later, he would go on to ask a question. Let's listen in. I'm, I'm sure we can do an entire episode just on that. But when you think of the everyday consumer, is that something you know, someone with not a ton of money, but has some level of finance to afford a leased slash purchase car. Are you pushing people in that direction when they're, when they're asking you for advice? I follow the market. I'm very like unemotional about electric gas, ice. Like there's some people who are very passionate about it. I don't really care. I care. Show me the deals, show me the money, right? That's what I want to see. Now, I think electric is a phenomenal technology if if it's well executed. I think Tesla's executing it the best in the US. I've been driving one of their vehicles now recently, a Tesla Model Y. I kind of mystery shopped a whole like, you know, car buying experience for them. I tested it out and I would say it was pretty good. There was definitely some things I didn't like, but you know, nothing is perfect. But we'll get to that later. Um, here's what I'll tell you. Tesla is the market leader in the US. They have over 50% market share. They've dropped their prices by as much as 50% over the last two years, right? That's an astonishing price drop by an automaker. I think there's many, many great just use cases for their cars, right? Your family, maybe you're in the suburbs, you have a garage especially, right? It's amazing. You can charge at home. Um, I will say that even if you don't have a garage, right? Like there's chargers are proliferating all over the country. I have a news website called Car Dealership Guy News. It's cdg.news and we post all these stats and whatnot. And one stat we posted last week was that there are 183,000 publicly available charging ports right now across 50,000 stations in the US. And that's grown by 13,000 ports in the last three months. So charging stations are just proliferating like crazy. Um, but what I'll tell you is that it does come down in a way to personal preference. I'm in the camp that you should have one EV and like one hybrid. I just think that that's the best experience, right? You have that one hybrid for like extremely long range or maybe not even long range. Maybe we're going to the mountains with your family. Who knows what, right? You just don't want that range anxiety. Great. Have a hybrid and then have an EV for like the day-to-day -day drive. Like you can't beat the torque on an EV, right? The thing just speeds, right? Like you really don't have maintenance. Lease the EV. I would say that. Very, very important. Don't buy it, in my opinion, right? Lease it. Um, again, EV prices have dropped so significantly. They're extremely volatile, right? You have new technologies coming out. Like you don't know if China is going to enter the US market and make EV prices drop even further. My personal preference is lease to EV. You don't know the battery, how it's going to be in five, 10 years. Lease it. Don't take that risk on yourself. Put it on the leasing company to take the risk. I think they're phenomenal vehicles when it's well executed. Tesla is definitely leading it. I think the legacy manufacturers are lagging in a big way. I think their product quality and selection is not as good. Again, there are exceptions. There are EVs, legacy EVs that have done fairly well. Um, but I would say the overwhelming majority have not. And it just simply comes down to just the product uh, selection and quality, in my opinion. So you didn't mention savings. Is there anything to keep in mind as it relates to tax savings, um, cost savings, no gas, yeah. but then electric goes up? What are, what are the numbers looking like? Yeah, so that's the other big part of the EV game, which is that if you buy a new EV, uh, you could actually get a $7,500 credit on your taxes from making that purchase. Now, there's a limit. Like I think it's a couple. It's like around like $300,000, more or less. And that's on a new car, right? So just right there, if that new car is $40,000, well, guess what? You just saved $7,500 on your taxes, and that's real savings. Now, the other big savings here is on the used EV tax credit, right? So this is something that was introduced earlier this year. And it has completely changed the game for used car dealers. Because now, if you're buying a used car, under $25,000 or at the max of $25,000,
you can be eligible for up to $4,000 tax savings and it can be applied automatically towards your down payment. Crazy. As an example, if you're out of equity on your vehicle, right? Let's say you own a vehicle, you know, a lot more than it's worth, you're underwater and you don't really have a down payment. Well, guess what? You go to the used car dealership that has used EVs and it's you find one that's under 25K, you buy that, the dealer right away applies for the tax credit for you, it gets auto applied as a down payment towards that vehicle. So it's pretty crazy that the, the type of government stimulus that they're putting towards EVs, it's pretty crazy how, to what extent they've gone and you know how it's impacting the actual demand because I know dealers that are selling like 30% used EVs right now. Of all their used vehicles, 30% are EVs and it's overwhelmingly because of the, the tax credit that they introduced this year. In my mind, I keep track of how many cyber trucks I see on a weekly basis. <laughs> and like I said, we're in July 2024. I would say month over month, I'm seeing, you know, double. I used to see two or three. Now I was driving home from the Catskill Mountains yesterday. I probably saw just three yesterday. Is that a viable option for people? Is that a, a marketing tactic? And and just to piggyback off that, I like that you're unemotional about it because there is a Tesla slash Elon Musk effect where people, I think, aren't even thinking about the numbers. It's almost like a Gucci handbag. It's a brand at this point. So I like giving people the cold hard facts because if there is another electric vehicle that makes more economical sense and doesn't have that anxiety and they have plenty of stations across the U.S., a friend of ours just bought or leased a Rivian. I don't know too much about it, but I guess the question here is how much of Tesla is great marketing versus quality? Look, Teslas are not the most luxurious in terms of like interior, just quality. It's like pretty plasticky and whatnot. I'm not saying it's terrible, but it's it's not the most luxurious. And it's also like pretty plain Jane. Like, you know, like the, the sun visor is like this little like rinky dink fold thing. But I think that our generation, Gen Z, millennials, like they're buying lots of cars. At one point, that wasn't the thought, but it is, they're buying lots of cars and it is happening. And actually vehicle interest is rising with Gen Z. It's pre pretty interesting. Maybe it could be like an independence thing. I don't know. Um, so what I'll tell you is that our generation puts a high value on the connected experience, I call it, right? Like tech, products, the features, right? I think, you know, Tesla's technology is unmatched. If you just drive one, I mean, it's just the tech that they have. It's all seamless. It all works together. It's pretty mind-boggling that they don't use Apple CarPlay, but they have an experience that's just as good, if not better. So I think they've done a great job there. They've nailed it. I think that they know what their audience really cares and values. And they're smart, right? They don't offer... 50 different models, right? They offer like a couple models and people buy it, right? It's like the iPhone. Like they offer like, you know, a couple colors and whatnot and like, that's it. So Tesla knows who they're going after and they're doing a very great job at it. It's a good vehicle. You know, even though prices have fallen so much, I still would hesitate to buy one versus just lease one because the leasing the leasing offers are pretty compelling. You're going to pay like 15 to 25% less per month versus actually buying. You're not going to have to put as much money down, right? You could otherwise invest that money in the stock market or something. You're not going to take the residual risk. You're not going to take the product risk. Like there's so many reasons why I say like, just lease the car. Don't deal with the headache. Give it back. Obviously, if you drive a ton, it's a problem. I get that. Uh, if you drive like, you know, 20, 30,000 miles per year, like you're just going to have to buy it. And like, and if you drive that much, you probably do it for work. So like, who cares? Buy it anyways. But otherwise, I would tell you, like, you know, it's a great car. The Cybertruck last month was the best selling vehicle over priced over $100,000 in the country. It, it beat the Escalade and any other vehicle. Uh, so the Cybertruck is, you know, it's doing really well. Will it last? I have no idea. Probably not, right? It's, it's, it's novel, it's new. People are buying them like crazy. Um, I don't, I'm not saying it's going to kind of go to last place, but like it is number one right now in terms of sales for vehicles over $100,000. And it's, it's pretty impressive. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, as we move through 2024, many people are looking for and cashing in on tax deductions, which is why I've been telling you what more and more people are doing. They're putting money into a charitable entity without actually having to allocate the money to a specific cause right away. So how does it work? I'll tell you. It's called the Donors Fund. You create an account in under 60 seconds and any money that's placed in the account is instantly eligible for an immediate tax deduction. 
you can then decide throughout 2024 and beyond where you'd like to allocate that money. It's absolutely free. No hidden charges, no funny business. If you love running around, pulling your hair out, trying to find your donation receipts across dozens of organizations, the Donors Fund is not for you. If you want everything streamlined in a single place, the Donors Fund is for you. All your donations, one button away. We're talking about a robust online platform, a super friendly mobile app. It features a bank-like system for your charitable giving. You can also invest the dollars to grow as you determine which charity to allocate the funds to. They offer checkbooks, debit cards, caring customer service, and more. So here's what to do. Visit the donorsfund.org slash kosher money, links in the show notes, and create your account. Click around their website to learn more about it. The Donors Fund, welcome to the future. And now back to this week's episode. And Tesla owners slash leasers, how much are they spending in electric on a monthly basis versus the gas costs that they're saving on? Again, depends, but I think the average, the average person's on charging an electric vehicle is spending about $35 a month. That's the rough like nationwide average on, you know, the average miles driven and all that. So take it for what it's worth. You know, if you drive, if you're above average, if you drive, you know, more than like like a rough, like a thousand miles a month, right. Then you might pay more of that, but it's pretty cost efficient. Um, nowadays to drive in electric vehicles. It just, you know, charging is 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 less expensive than gas. But again, they all have their positives and negatives, right? Like I would say with like an EV, you're going to have to replace your tires more often. You just will. Like EVs have more torque, tires wear out faster. You're going to have to replace them more often. But with like an internal combustion, you're going to have to do oil changes and other types of maintenance. So again, it's not in perfect parity, but, you know, each one has its nuances. I do believe that most EVs so are less expensive to maintain over the lifetime of that vehicle with the big exception again being the battery which is why i say just lease the car you don't have to deal with it you mentioned bmw as as a great leasing option which cars are in that group? Which cars do you say, hey, there's great savings there. It's a great quality car. You can't go wrong with blank. I actually posted today, I posted a list of some some new deals in the market. Here's what I'll tell you, right? Nowadays, when if you lease a car, you lease a brand new car, right? You drive it for what, like two to three years, 36,000 miles or so, maybe less, like it's just preference. It's not, you're not going to tell any difference. You're not going to deal with any, you know, big, big maintenance jobs or it's just like, it's pretty cut and dry. And it really does come down to preference. Like these manufacturers have less and less to compete on. Think about it. They used to compete on like engine and this and that, right? Nowadays, if everyone's driving electric, which they're not, but like we're, market share is growing, right? If, if more and more people are driving electric, if the technology in the car on more and more vehicles is Apple CarPlay, or it's Tesla, their proprietary software, right? Like what's left to compete on? Like look, design, the competition vectors and all these vehicles continues to shrink. And so these manufacturers are sweating. They're saying, how are we gonna you know, make money in the future, right? If, there's, if you're commoditizing the vehicle that I'm producing, what happens? Margin goes down, you're making less money. And so they have to find other ways of making money. So what they're doing now is there's all this exp- you know, exploration around like, you know, microservices and like subscription packages. I'm sure you may have heard about like BMW charging a subscription for their heated seats in the car that you own. It's like, it's mind boggling, right? But you're going to see more of these things. Like this is going to continue. It's going to increasing. You're going to have these like, you know, tokenized services and whatnot, but that's the bottom line, right? That's kind of how the market is trending. If you're just leasing a vehicle, it really is preference. What's good for your family, right? What's the right size? What's good for you? You know, what look do you like? Do you enjoy? Do you want electric? Do you not want electric? Do you want to charge, right? Can you charge? Is that convenient for you? You know, what do you really value? I think that's what drives it. And then beyond that, you know, you can look at what's going to current deals and prices. I'm just looking at my list now, right? You have like a Nissan Leaf. It's an electric car that with zero down, you can get it for $200 a month. Right. Like these are like prices that, again, it's a leaf for what it's worth. Right. No one wants to drive a decent leaf, but still $200 a month. Right. Like not a bad first car potentially. Um, And there's other examples. Right. Lots of EVs in these like top 20 deals that I post. Lots of EVs uh, because market demand has cooled for most EVs. But, you know, these things come and go. 
And, you know, like I said, follow the supply. It's where you'll find the deal. I have a ton of respect for people who drive cars that aren't keeping up with the Jones or here we say keeping up with the cones in the sense that they don't care, right? They pull into their driveway, they pull up in front of their apartment knowing that their entire monthly costs are $272, right? They're driving an 18-year-old used Toyota Camry. It it drives beautifully. Yes, it has 108,000 miles on it, but they're living the good life. They're not looking at many hundreds, if not over $1,000 in in auto costs every month. And we had a guest on that was even talking about how there's this growing trend within the community of, hey, it's not about driving the shiniest, newest vehicle, but there's a lot of bliss in knowing that you're not piling on to the debt that you have as it relates to growing costs and especially in the auto field. There was a stat that CDK put out, which was that Gen Z is, as a percentage, is buying like the the largest share of luxury vehicles, which is and and by the way, there was also a big addendum that they're not buying it with just their money, like parents are helping. But the point being that, um, and I'm not sure if Tesla was classified as a luxury vehicle in this study. I don't think it was because uh, it used to be, but since their prices have come down over the last you know five years, they're typically no longer classified as luxury. Uh, But needless to say, the point being that Instagram and all that stuff has really impacted just perception, right? People want to kind of look cool and whatnot. I think that as, you know, the economy tightens up and, you know, people's incomes get tighter and you have to be more thoughtful with your spending, you know, people are going to have no choice but to be a little bit more practical to a certain extent. And and look, it varies. Like some people really care about the car they drive. I, I tend to agree with you. Well, I... I'm even more so in the sense that I'm so jaded to these vehicles. You know, my friends buy a car. Oh, check it out. It's like, wow, cool. Like, I don't really care. You know, I call it like nuts and bolts, right? To me, think about it. Sold cars for so many years, right? We had dealerships and blah, blah, blah. Like, it was an asset. Like, I looked at my balance sheet. I just saw a bunch of lines. Like, it didn't mean anything to me, right? You get like, just like, you know, just like I said, totally like unemotional. Um, and I kind of, and it kind of stuck with me even till now. I just look for like the best value. Right. Like my wife drives a Toyota Sienna hybrid. And like I remember when I first bought that car, like some people that know me pretty well and like, you know, like they were a little surprised, I think I would say. Um, in a good way. All right. Like, oh wait, really? Like, uh, like, you know what I mean? Like the point I agree with you in that, you know, you want something practical, convenient, not trying to be flashy everywhere you go. It's all per- preference. So I'm sure some people listen to this are like, yeah, I agree. And others are like, no, nah, like I, I I love cars. I want that vroom vroom in the morning. And like, honestly, like good for you. Go buy it. But it's all personal preference. And, you know, everyone, it really is different for everyone. And, and I haven't been at the dealership. You can really see people come in a lot that are just like all over the map with what they want and how flashy they want that vehicle to be. How much do you care about that? Let's talk about Yossi Levy now. I know that guy. Yeah, you know him, right? He has developed his career. Sounds like there are multiple revenue streams. What does your day-to-day look like? And what does your Yossi Levy LLC look like? What are you doing in terms of business? How do you make money? You mentioned the media brand. Sounds like you have a ton of data. Are you monetizing that? Walk us through that. Yeah, so we do a couple things, right? First of all, I have an audience of over 10,000 dealers across the US, right? It's a very valuable audience uh, for advertisers uh, because dealers spend a lot of money and they want to get in front of them. And it's very tough to get in front of, you know, a dealer that is, you know, making millions of dollars per year, is very busy, and they're not going to waste their time, right? Like, what are they? Re- what content are they really consuming? Well, content about their industry because they want to get smarter, they want to make more money, they want to save money, right? So that's what I bring to the table. I kind of fell into it. I just started sharing content. And dealers resonated with it. And I was like, all right, let me share more content. And then I was like, okay, I'm no longer CEO of the company that I founded and I was CEO for five years, right? I helped sunset it the right way. And you know, we appointed someone to take over after I left. And I said, okay, what's next? And I said, look, this media stuff is pretty cool. I think there is a need, right? Like the quote unquote establishment has been running this automotive media space for quite some time. It's very stuffy. Everything is written like it was, you know, written like 50 years ago. It's not concise. It all looks super old school, right? Google every automotive news website as you're listening to me right now and just look what the UI, the user interface of all these websites. It's just like, it's not what I envisioned. I thought we could do a lot better. And so 
I slowly, slowly started building Car Dealership Guy Media. I built a podcast today worth a number one podcast in automotive retail, you know, over 45,000 weekly listeners. I built, you know, a newsletter, 70,000 subscribers, large portion of them are in the industry, a lot of them, but a lot of them are not consumers and whatnot. I just, you know, I, I launched Car Dealership Guy News, right? I hired reporters to come and actually report daily on news. I just went, you know, brick by brick. And it got to a point where, you know, I sort of have all these different outlets and, and avenues to deliver information to my stakeholders, right? And my stakeholders are like my ideal customer profile is the dealer, right? My audience is not only dealers, but I create content first for the dealer because I know what dealers, they want to know about our industry. And so the way we make money today is several ways. First of all, we do brand deals, right? So advertisers, again, want to get in front of dealers. They come to us. Um, you know, I've worked with many of these advertisers as a client, so it's pretty cool, right? I know I know these products. In many cases, I know what they do and how they impact the dealership. So that's a really cool thing. I also launched a talent agency. I didn't even know what a talent agency meant nine months ago, to be very clear, right? But I had automotive influencers coming to me and saying, hey, can you help us scale up our production, video editing, audio engineering, you know, creative content, like blah, 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 blah. Or like even behind the scenes, legal operations, like these things are hard, right? Now I've built some businesses in the past. So I had a little bit more experience and I was able to, you know, build this machine, right? Today we're 12 people, some part-time, some full-time, but it was still very difficult. And I realized that your average day-to-day creator just doesn't have that experience. So I launched a talent agency where I said, I'm going to represent you as your manager and we will help you sell your media, create your media, do business development. And all you need to do is create. Right. And so we signed our first talent. His name is Russ Flips Whips. You can find him on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. He's got hundreds of thousands of followers, probably over a million by now. Um, and we've signed several other creators since, which we're going to announce soon. But the point being is that, you know, we said, again, we started by doing our own brand deals. And when we got good at it, we said, okay, well, maybe we can do this for other people as well and help them out of people that we believe in, that have a good product and that we would be comfortable bringing under our wing. And so that's the model today. It's a combination of an ad business and a talent agency. And we're about to launch a third business. Um, It's not ready yet. So TBD, uh, but I'm excited we're going to be announcing in the next couple of months. Putting on my business cap for a second, you know, the success you've had and the personality that you, you don't sound like a stubborn guy. It doesn't sound like you're stuck in your ways. And there are some people that are very good at one thing and they just do that for 40, 50 years, and that's their legacy. For those listening that either looking to start a business, have a business, what advice would you give them when you're thinking about the growth that you've had and maybe some of the reasons why you've had that? When I left my prior business, you know, I looked at my wife one day and look, I had, you know, I had some, some money set aside and whatnot, but yeah, I still have a lot of expenses. I have, you know, three kids, thank God. And I said, look, I, we might have to move to like a two bedroom so I can, you know, reduce our overhead and find the next big thing, right? Like I, I legitimately had that conversation with her. That didn't happen, you know, we're blessed. But first of all, don't follow your passion. That's like BS advice. But in all seriousness, like you have to find where you're, what you are good at, what the market needs, right? And like what at least interests you to a certain level, right? Like, that's not a passion necessarily. Like that is just like, I am interested in, I'm interested in how plumbing works. And then I find, come to find that I'm really good with my hands. Like I know how to just, you know, I'm technical. And by the way, like everyone needs a freaking plumber. So like that's boom, like you might be good at that. So the point I'm trying, I use that simplistic example because like where that converges is where you can create value. So with me, I always knew I was good at the marketing side of like the business. And I, I've always been very creative. Like I've I've struggled in environments where I had to do like very like mechanical boring work. Like what you said, 40 years doing the same thing, I'd put a bullet in my head. Like I would not do that. So you have to know yourself, right? And it takes time to get to know yourself, right? I'm 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 still relatively young, but it took me probably a decade to really learn that about myself. Right. I knew I, I knew that I cannot sit and do the same thing every day forever. That's just not my personality. Then I knew that I'm like pretty decent at marketing. And then I started talking online and people were listening. And then I remembered, oh my God, wait, I've actually been a freaking dealer for 13 years. I know what the hell I'm talking about. I raised tens of millions of dollars. I've sat in boardrooms with billionaires and I've also, you know, shoveled poop from the floor on the dealership. Like not actually like, you know, I'm being facetious, but you get the point. So 
all that said, right, you have to think about these things and say like, you know, what interests me, right? Get good at it. And like, you'll create value as long as there's a need in the market, but you just can't over romanticize things. You got to try, you got to keep trying and, you know, think about it, especially for me, when I failed, I was like, I came off this high, right? At one point we were valued at over $200 million. I was like, you know, I thought I was invincible. And then suddenly you get slapped in the face and you're like, I'm not invincible. And, but then like, you just have to get back up. Like no one cares that you failed, right? Do the right thing that is, right? Like fail the right way. There's a right or wrong way to fail. Meaning like, you know, close things up as best as possible for all stakeholders, but you just got to keep going. And then once you're successful again, suddenly everyone forgets and you're like, you know, the next best thing since sliced bread. So I hope that's helpful to someone, but you really just got to keep going and just, you know, it's, 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 a, it's that simple. There's no silver bullet. You've been at this for quite a few years. Who are some of the coolest people you've met along the way that have reached out, given you kudos? Who comes to mind? Look, so Elon Musk, I got to give him credit. He really put me on the map. Like he retweeted me. He commented on my stuff. You know, he follows me. He subscribes to my X account. And that did just provide credibility. Like for, for right or wrong, like it just did. You know, people are like, oh, Elon Musk, let me follow, right? He retweeted one of my posts. He got like 20 million impressions. I, I gained like 100,000 followers. Like that was a big thing for the brand. Bill Ackman, a big investor from New York, he, he uh, follows me as well. So, you know, I tweeted him like a couple months ago. I was like, hey, uh, you know, would love to meet up. Just, you know, chat about the markets and whatnot. He was like, yeah, let's do it. So we met up um, in New York. I went to his office. You know, we had a good chat for like an hour just about markets or whatever, you know, a bunch of stuff. And it was really cool. So I think like that's the power of social media, right? Like you put yourself out there, right? I have up today about like 550,000 followers, but you really come across some like fascinating people. I um, mean, it's not just them. Like, by the way, like also some like really small accounts, like these like anonymous accounts reaching out. Yeah. Like, hey, I, like I own the Indiana Pacers. Like crazy people that you're just like, what? Like, where are you? 11 total followers, no profile photo. I own the Indiana yeah. Pacers. And like right. that that person specifically like does have a profile photo, but like right. there's other people that like, you know, like, like one guy, I'll tell you one guy, um, yeah. he's like, hey, my dad is an artist and we want to create like a picture for you. And they sent me this like hand carved, like wood painting thingy, just like for free, like just send it to me. Like, Super right. cool. So right. like, there's like so many p- cool people out there. And like, if you just stay true to yourself, you kind of put what you're interested in, like you're going to find your tribe very, you know, at, at, or not very quickly, but at some point. And, and it's fun, you know, it's fun when, you know, you can just interact with these people who are fans of the brand. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, if you donate to the poor in Israel or anywhere else for that matter, do you know the first place they'll likely spend that money? It's at the grocery store. Since its inception in 1788, Kol Chabad's priority has been supporting nutrition security in the Jewish community. Many people in Israel face the prospect of going to bed hungry regularly, which is why the organization focuses on providing food and essential support to help people live with dignity and health. All households of its programs are screened and audited by local municipalities based on need, Local governments, they cover 20% of costs, while Kola Chabad Get This makes up the remaining 80% through fundraising efforts and online donations from people like you. So reach into your pocket and donate a few dollars, a few shekels, whatever you can to our family and friends in Israel. They need us now more than ever. So visit kolachabad.org slash kosher money. Make a one-time or recurring donation. The link is in the show notes. And on behalf of the people in Israel, thank you. Thank you so much. Now back to this week's episode. I find that on WhatsApp, I I put out a WhatsApp status, nothing too crazy, 1,500 people, but there are hundreds of people who follow it that I have no clue who they are. I don't even know their name. I just see their initials and I have the most in-depth conversations with them. They're smart. I don't really care what their name is, but they're intriguing. They're stimulating. They always have something smart to share and you can go back and forth without even ever knowing their real name. And it's gotten to the point where that's okay. We were growing up. It was like stranger danger. Don't talk to that person. Don't get in their car. Now I'm not saying go get in the car, but the fact that you can build relationships with really cool no. people across the world has really uh, brought the world. In it. And, and Uber is a great example of that, right? Where like, think about it, like go back two decades, right? Get in the car with a stranger or what? Right. That was crazy. Right. And like Uber was just like, you know, everywhere. And it's like totally normal. And like, you know, 16 year old girls getting into Uber is alone. She's like, what? Um, So, you know, that's a great example right there. Like, I mean, things change, you know? You mentioned Uber. Do you know people that have gotten rid of their vehicle 
and actually save money just using Uber as their primary source of transportation? Definitely not save money, right? Like try taking an Uber every day. It's going to add up pretty quickly. Some people in the cities and stuff do that. It never really took off to that, like how people expected it to, right? Uber is amazing. I love it. I use it. But it's not like a, it doesn't replace the car for most people, right? Or another form of transit. So that was that was the fear. I remember when I was raising money for my startup, investors were asking me, oh, but like, will people still buy cars? And I'm like, they're going to buy cars. Like, this is like, you're, you have, like, you know, you're missing the plot here. Like, Uber is incredible. Like, it's going to build a ton of value. Not going to replace the car. Will robo taxis or stuff like that? I don't know. I mean, time will tell. But Uber in the form, in its current form, I didn't believe it was just going to replace the car. And it hasn't, but it has been an incredible technology that's, you know, super, super useful. What didn't we cover? What should I have asked you? What's something that keeps you up at night? What's something that helps you sleep like a baby? Closing remarks, a book to share, something intriguing. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm a I'm a bad reader. Like I... I just don't read enough books now with with all this social media stuff and growing cardio. Honestly, I read my own news. So I go to CDG News every morning. Again, that's the website I mentioned where we report and I'm just like, oh, like let's see what's happening in the car business today. You know, what keeps me up at night? Well, recently there was this big hack in the car business. Um, you know, like over 50% of dealers, their software was hacked. That was, you know, very substantial moment for the industry. Dealers were very resilient and were able to still sell cars and whatnot, but that that was a big impact. I think black swans like that kind of make you wonder like, you know, if if you can just get hacked like that, demand ransom, get paid ransom, like will that happen again? Right? Like will they continue going after the car business knowing how much money is in it? Will they go after other industries? I think that's the kind of stuff that I think about. I'm like, you know, what is, where is our industry really headed? I think the other thing is just like general uncertainty in our industry. Like there's never been a time with more change happening in the car business. The, the Q1 of this year was the most busy in terms of dealership buy sales ever, meaning dealerships that, you know, consolidated bought other dealers ever, right? Like that's pretty re- remarkable when you think about just like, you know, the environment we're in today economically, just like interest rates and whatnot. But it also signals a couple of things. It signals that, you know, yes, some dealers made a, or lots of dealers made a lot of money and are cashing out. Although there's also a lot of uncertainty and it's becoming tougher to be a small dealer with the internet, with social media, with marketing. Like you need more leverage, you need more resources. And so I just wonder, I'm like, you know, where is our industry headed? What will it look like in five to 10 years? Do I think dealers will still be around? Yes. Do I think they're going to change and continue changing from their current form? Also, Yes. I think they will become more fulfillment centers for on the new car side where you're going to buy, like you said, that that more of that Amazon experience up front or like that Tesla car buying experience. You know, used cars will still be around. Um, and again, even that's going to allow you to buy more of that like Carvana experience. Um, service is probably the biggest moat or competitive advantage that local retailers have, right? Because service is a really tough thing to recreate. And if you are, you know, a big manufacturer, right? Like that's just like very tough to start replacing tires and, you know, brakes all over the country. So I think that is a big competitive advantage for dealers, but our, the industry is going to change a ton. And it's, uh, I think it's going to be exciting. I think it's going to be better for consumers, for dealers. I think it's going to evolve and everyone's going to, you know, end up having just a, a, a better, better experience with, with, the, with the car business. Yeah, see, well, this was exciting. I think this is going to help enlighten quite a few people. We're going to put a link to your various different media Appreciate organizations. It. We'll drop them all in the show notes, all the efforts Thank to you. your Twitter, to your news website, to your podcast. Um, I'm sure there's a way for people to contact you there or drop you a note. I'm sure you can't get back to everyone, but um, really thank you for your time because uh, we know you're incredibly busy and what you're doing at the crux of it is helping people, right? You so happen to be at the intersection of helping and you seem to enjoy what you do, which is uh, a blessing. Yeah. Appreciate it, Ellie. Love the podcast and, um, you know, happy, happy to help. So I hope this was uh, helpful for some people and um, yeah, I'm looking forward. Uh, I'm looking forward for more. So thanks, man. Let's do it again soon. Take care. Before we wrap up, I want to share some bonus thoughts from Yassi on other important car related topics. We couldn't cover everything, but I asked him about extended warranties, the growing price of auto insurance, and finding honest mechanics. So let's get into that. I asked him if extended warranties were worth it when buying a new or used car. He explained 
that extended warranties can be worth it and are usually worth it, but it really depends on the warranty company. If you work with a reputable dealer, they'll likely have a reputable warranty company. So make sure you get a fully loaded quote on everything, including the extended warranty before you commit to the price of the vehicle. Yossi said that car companies make a lot more money from extended warranties than from selling the cars themselves. So when you buy a $20,000 car, the company only makes about 10%, $2,000 in profit. But if you buy a $2,000 extended warranty, the company might make up to $1,200 in profit, 60% margins. So extended warranties are a big money maker for them. And they're particularly valuable as a consumer if you're buying a car that is historically less reliable, like some German or high mileage domestic vehicles. That's been the ongoing trend for years, he says. In contrast, Japanese cars tend to be more reliable, so you may or may not need an extended warranty for that. Let's talk about the growing cost of auto insurance. We can't do an episode on auto leasing without discussing auto insurance. Yossi says it's a real problem and it's weighing heavily on people's pockets. His advice is to shop around and work with dealers to use their vendors. Dealers have a vested interest in helping you get the lowest rate. They want to close the deal. They often have access to various agencies where you can get better rates. Additionally, where you live plays a significant role in the insurance costs. So if you're based in Florida, he says, good luck to you. Unfortunately, there are no magic tricks to significantly reduce auto insurance costs, but shopping around and comparing rates can make a difference. And lastly, if you're looking for an honest mechanic, Yossi recommends relying on online reviews. Many good local mechanics have strong online reputations. There's a website like dealerrader.com. We'll put that in the show notes that can help you find a reputable dealership service center. And you can find which advisors are the best, which technicians are the best. And that can guide you in making a better decision where to service your vehicle. What I find what works is WhatsApp asking friends in the neighborhood who they've been pleased with over the years, and then using people, friends who are happy. So that'll do it for our auto episode. What do we have cooking next? I'm happy you asked. Our next episode is recorded. The return of the great Dave Ramsey. You may have heard of him. It was a fun, insightful conversation down in Tennessee. We covered a heck of a lot. And then after that, we have the long-awaited tuition episode. So much cooking. Make sure you come hungry. Speaking of food, we also want to do a grocery episode, so we need to find the right guest who can shed light on the best way to save money. How do we do that? That's our question for you. If you have a guest suggestion, a sister-in-law, a cousin who's smart on the topic, knows how to save money, can speak eloquently, is not afraid of a camera, visit livinglechaim.com slash suggest, submit your idea, and let's have a conversation on how to help people save on a future episode. Thank you to the sponsors of this week's episode, Twillery, I'm rocking the shirt, Kol Chabad in Israel and the Donors Fund. You can make a donation to Kol Chabad on the Donors Fund. You can find all their links in the show notes and you can find all of Yossi's links there as well. Thank you so much to Yossi for joining us. If you would benefit from a financial advisor or speaking to somebody for free to help you budget, get out of debt or anything else finance related, visit the OU's livingsmarterjewish.org, which has literally helped thousands of people just like you and me. You can help make Living L'Chaim a success. You can give us a one-time or recurring donation at livinglechaim.com slash donate. The money you provide gets pumped back into these shows, which you may be enjoying. I don't know. I'm not a fortune teller. Yaakov, are we on um, the donors fund, Living L'Chaim? You can look them up. Look it up. Yaakov says, yeah. If you want to help us out big time, this is even bigger, Yaakov says, visit Apple Podcasts or Spotify and rate us five stars. That helps tell the magical algorithm that Kosher Money podcast is awesome and it helps us keep the lights on. Five stars, how you doing? On YouTube, we now provide premium membership where you can get early access to episodes and more. And like I always say, if you don't wanna or can't pay for premium membership, then who cares? This world is a hallway anyway. Until next time, keep your money kosher. Bye-bye. Living L'chaim.